The Secret Garden, Chapter 19, Part 2 That night, Colin slept without once awakening, and when he opened his eyes in the morning, he lay still and smiled without knowing it. Smiled because he felt so curiously comfortable. It was actually nice to be awake, and he turned over and stretched his limbs luxuriously. He felt as if tight strings which had held him had loosened themselves and let him go. He did not know that Dr. Craven would have said that his nerves had relaxed and rested themselves. Instead of lying and staring at the wall and wishing he had not awakened, his mind was full of the plans that he and Mary had made yesterday, of pictures of the garden and of Dickon and his wild creatures. It was so nice to have things to think about, and he had not been awake more than ten minutes when he heard feet running along the corridor and Mary was at the door. The next minute she was in the room and had run across to his bed, bringing with her a waft of fresh air full of the scent of the morning. You've been out, you've been out. There's that nice smell of leaves, he cried. She had been running and her hair was loose and blown and she was bright with the air and pink-cheeked, though he could not see it. It's so beautiful, she said, a little breathless with her speed. We never saw anything so beautiful. It has come. I thought it had come that other morning, but it was only coming. It's here now, it's come. The spring. Dickens says so. Has it? cried Colin. And though he really knew nothing about it, he felt his heart beat. He actually sat up in bed. Open the window, he added, half laughing, with joyful excitement and half in his own fancy. Perhaps you may hear golden trumpets. And though he laughed, Mary was at the window in a moment and in a moment more it was open wide, and freshness and softness and scent and bird songs were pouring through. That's fresh air, she said. Lie on your back and draw in long breaths of it. That's what Dickon does when he's lying on the moor. He says he feels it in his veins and it makes him strong, and he feels as if he could live forever and ever. Breathe it and breathe it. She was only repeating what Dickon had told her, but she caught Colin's fancy. For ever and ever? Does it make him feel like that? He said, and he did as she told him, drawing in long, deep breaths over and over again, until he felt that something quite new and delightful was happening to him. Mary was at his bedside again. Things are crowding up out of the earth, she ran on in a hurry, and there are flowers uncurling, and buds on everything, and the green veil has covered nearly all the grey, and the birds are in such a hurry about their nests for fear they may be too late, that some of them are even fighting for places in the secret garden. And the rose bushes look as wick as wick can be, and there are primroses in the lanes and woods, and the seeds we planted are up, and Dickon has brought the fox and the crow and the squirrels and a newborn lamb. And then she paused for breath. The newborn lamb Dickon had found three days before lying by its dead mother amongst the gorse bushes on the moor. It was not the first motherless lamb he had found, and he knew what to do with it. He had taken it to the cottage, wrapped in his jacket, and he had let it lie near the fire and fed it with warm milk. It was a soft thing, with a darling silly baby face and legs rather long for its body. Dickon had carried it over the moor in his arms and its feeding bottle was in his pocket with a squirrel and when Mary had sat under a tree with its limp warmness huddled on her lap, she had felt as if she were too full of strange joy to speak. A lamb, a lamb, a living lamb who lay on your lap like a baby. She was describing it with great joy, and Colin was listening and drawing in long breaths of air when the nurse entered. She started a little at the sight of the open window. She had sat stifling in the room many a warm day, because her patient was sure that open windows gave people a cold. "'Are you sure you're not chilly?' Master Colin, she inquired. "'No,' was the answer. "'I am breathing long breaths of fresh air. "'It makes you strong. "'I'm going to get up to the sofa for breakfast, "'and my cousin will have breakfast with me.' The nurse went away, concealing a smile, to give the order for two breakfasts. She found the servants' hall a more amusing place than the invalid's chamber, and just now everybody wanted to hear the news from upstairs. There was a great deal of joking about the unpopular young recluse, who, as the cook said, had found his master and good for him. The servants' hall had been very tired of his tantrums, 
and the butler, who was a man with a family, had more than once expressed his opinion that the invalid would be all the better for a good hiding. When Colin was on his sofa and the breakfast for two was put upon the table, he made an announcement to the nurse in his most Rajah-like manner. A boy and a fox and a crow and two squirrels and a newborn lamb are coming to see me this morning. I want them brought upstairs as soon as they come, he said. You are not to begin playing with the animals in the servants' hall and keep them there. I want them here. The nurse gave a little gasp and tried to conceal it with a cough. Yes, sir, she answered. I'll tell you what you can do, added Colin, waving his hand. You can tell Martha to bring him here. The boy is Martha's brother. His name is Dickon, and he is an animal charmer. I hope the animals won't bite, Master Colin, said the nurse. I told you he was a charmer, said Colin, austerely. Charmer's animals never bite. There are snake charmers in India, said Mary, and they can put their snakes' heads in their mouths. Goodness, shuddered the nurse. They ate their breakfast with the morning air pouring in upon them. Colin's breakfast was a very good one, and Mary watched him with serious interest. You'll begin to get fatter, just as I did, she said. I never wanted my breakfast when I was in India, and now I always want it. I want mine this morning, said Colin. Perhaps it was the fresh air. When do you think Dickon will come? He was not long in coming. In about ten minutes, Mary held up her hand. Listen, she said. Did you hear a call? Colin listened and heard it. The oddest sound in the world to hear inside a house. A horse. Call, call. Yes, he answered. That's soot, said Mary. Listen again. Do you hear a bleat? A tiny one? Oh, yes, cried Colin, quite flushing. That's a newborn lamb, said Mary. He's coming. Dickon's moorland boots were thick and clumsy, and though he tried to walk quietly, they made a clumping sound as he walked along the long corridors. Mary and Colin heard him marching, marching, until he passed through the tapestry door onto the soft carpet of Colin's own passage. If you please, sir, announced Martha, opening the door. If you please, sir, here's Dickon and his creatures. Dickon came in, smiling his nicest wide smile. The newborn lamb was in his arms, and the little red fox trotted by his side. Nut sat on his left shoulder, and Soot was on his right, and Shell's head and paws peeked out of his coat pocket. Colin slowly sat up and stared and stared as he had stared when he first saw Mary. But this was a stare of wonder and delight. The truth was that in spite of all he had heard, he had not in the least understood what this boy would be like, and that his fox and his crow and his squirrels and his lamb were so near to him, and his friendliness, that they seemed almost to be part of himself. Colin had never talked to a boy in his life, and he was so overwhelmed by his own pleasure and curiosity that he did not even think of speaking. But Dickon did not feel the least shy or awkward. He had not felt embarrassed because the crow had not known his language and had only stared and had not spoken to him the first time they met. Creatures were always like that until they found out about you. He walked over to Colin's sofa and put the newborn lamb quietly on his lap. And immediately the little creature turned to the warm velvet dressing gown and began to nuzzle and nuzzle into its folds and butt its tight curled head with soft impatience against his side. Of course, no boy could have helped speaking then. What is it doing? cried Colin. What does it want? It wants its mother, said Dickon, smiling more and more. I bought it to the bit hungry because I know I'd like to see it feed. He's knelt down by the sofa and took a feeding bottle from his pocket. Come on, little un, he said turning the small, woolly-white head with a gentle brown hand. This is what thou's after. Thou'll get more out of this than thou will out the silk velvet corpse. There now. And he pushed the rubber tip of the bottle into the nuzzling mouth, and the lamb began to suck it with ravenous ecstasy. After that, there was no wondering what to say. By the time the lamb fell asleep, questions poured forth, and Dickon answered them all. He told them how he had found a lamb just as the sun was rising three mornings ago. 
He had been standing on the moor listening to a skylark and watching him spin higher and higher into the blue until he was only a speck in the heights of blue. I'd almost lost him but for his song and I was wondering how a chap could hear it when it seemed as if he'd get it out of the world in a minute. And just then I heard something else far off among gorse bushes. It were a week bleating and I gnawed it was a new lamb that was hungry and I gnawed it wouldn't be hungry if it hadn't lost its mother somehow. So I set off searching. Eh, I did have a look for it. I went in and out among gorse bushes and round and round, and I always, always, always seemed to take a wrong turning. But at last I seed a bit of white by a rock on top of moor, and I climbed up and I found a little un half dead with cold and clemming. While he talked, Soot flew solemnly in and out of the open window and called remarks about the scenery while Nut and Shell made excursions into the big trees outside and ran up and down trunks and explored branches. Captain curled up near Dickon, who sat on the hearthrug from preference. They looked at the pictures in the gardening books, and Dickon knew all the flowers by their country names and knew exactly which ones were already growing in the secret garden. I couldn't say that their name, he said, pointing to one, under which was written Aquilegia, but just calls that a columbine. And that one there, it's a snapdragon, and they both grow wild in edges. But these in garden ones, and they're bigger and grander. There's some big clumps of columbine in garden. They'll look like a bed of blue and white butterflies fluttering when they're out. I'm going to see them, cried Colin. I am going to see them. Hi, that that one, said Mary, quite serious. And my mother lose no time about it. <laughs>